meeting everybody. A classic, sold millions, millions and millions of copies that book. Um, and Stephen King, the first one I read was Salem's Lot. But I think my favorite is The Stand and maybe Misery. And uh, yeah, John Wyndham, he wrote uh, Day of the Triffids. That was probably the first grown up book that I ever, I ever read. It's about walking killer plants. And like, there's this comic that makes everybody in the UK go blind. And then these, these plants grow legs and start walking around and stinging everybody and take over. <laughs> it's a classic. As children, authors find their way into storytelling through so many different doors. Yours actually came not by a books, but comic books, correct? I started writing comic books, comic strips. So I used to read a lot of comics, um, sci-fi comics, like uh, Judge Dredd, 2008, stuff like that. And so I wanted to be a, a comic writer. So I used to draw and write probably every, every month I would do a new issue it had loads of titles. One title was Phoenix comic. There is actually a comic called Phoenix now. Um, it, it was always changing. <laughs> and I don't have any, sadly. I've, I've lost them all. I've thrown them all away or they get, got lost when I was a kid. And then when I actually I wrote a book when I was 16, a, a, nov, a, a short novel, it was absolutely terrible. Um, and as soon as I finished it, I kind of never looked at it again. Um, and then I started trying to write properly when I was in my 20s, my early 20s. Tell viewers a little bit about your path, which veered from the norm and that you didn't study writing as a track, either a preparatory school or university. I didn't study creative writing at university. I did um, sociology. Um, and yeah, I never I don't think I've ever really had writing mentors. I've been I've I've been self-taught and I've, and I've done that by just reading tons and tons and tons. And um, if I'm the kind of person, if I try and read a book about how to write or take a course or something, halfway through the first chapter, I put it, I just want to go and do it. I, I can't, I'm not very good at learning stuff you, without, without just doing it myself. You learn by doing, as they say. Shame that you can't pass your driving test by doing that, but. <laughs> <laughs> Any advice for creative minds walking an unconventional path like you did, but that are still looking for a foot into the doorway of the book business? The, one, the only one that I ever actually found really useful was Save the Cat. And I know that that's um, intended for script writers, but it kind of breaks down how movies are written and you can use it for novels as well. It's very, very simple. It's written in a very humorous way. So it's easy to absorb. And I, at one point, kind of just for fun, I tried to um, adapt one of my books into a screenplay. Nothing ever happened with it, but it was a really, really useful exercise. And I used Save the Cat um, to kind of guide me through because I didn't have any idea how to write screenplays. And I guess it's just one of those things that you just, um, for me, the most useful thing is to read books and, and kind of break them down and analyze them and think about how did that writer do it? Um, but then by kind of osmosis, the, the blueprints for stories and, and how to create tension and dialogue and all that kind of stuff, it, see, it seeps into you. And um, yeah, so, I mean, I still read one or two books a week. I feel like I'm still constantly learning and and writing all the time. But yeah, if I had to, if I had to recommend one book for people who don't want to go the same route, um, yeah, Save the Cat is a good one. In that same spirit, did you get the idea for the Magpies years before you started actually sitting down to work on it? Well, it's a really, really long story, but I'll tell you the short version is that in the nineties, um, when I was in my twenties, I lived in this well, we say a flat, you'd say an apartment in the US. Um, and we had living beneath us a pair of, well, I don't know whether they were clinically psychopathic, but they were very <laughs> strange people and, and very difficult. And they didn't like having anybody living above them. And they tried to make our lives as miserable as possible. And so I, the Magpies was based on that experience. I just thought, how bad could this have got? 
And what would I have done in that situation if it had got really terrible and really scary? So, um, I, I mean, I wrote that book in 2000, 2001, and I had an agent at the time, um, but my agent was unable to find me a publisher. She got very, very close. It kind of was always getting turned down like at the last person in the chain at the publishers. Uh, and then um, I, I put it aside and wrote some more books. And then 10, 11 years later, um, no, actually 13 years later in 2013, um, I self-published it. I just thought, well, I might as well give it a go. And it got to number one in the UK, in the, in the rankings. And it's sold about 500,000 copies now, that book. Wow, 500,000 copies. That's inspiration for any author that needs motivation to get started even in self-publishing. How long after that did a big publisher come knocking? Well, I did, well, I did actually then sell the rights to Thomas and Mercer, who are my publisher now. Um, but it basically made, it meant that I could fulfill this dream that I'd had for years of becoming a full-time writer. For viewers who are fans, take us inside the world of the Magpies and Kirsty and Jamie as you were first creating them. So Jamie and Kirsty are just a very nice, sweet young couple who are moving into their first home together, um, in yeah, into this apartment, and and I mean she's a nurse in a in a like a children's hospital, and he's a just works in a software company. And yeah, they're just they're just meant to be the most ordinary um, people that you could ever meet. And um, but they're really they're very in love and they're really into each other. And um, and then this couple who live underneath them, Lucy and Chris, the Newtons, systematically set about trying to destroy their life, their relationship, um, and. And Jamie and Kirsty have to kind of try and, well, I mean, the, the book is about do they run away? Do they do they quit or do they do they try and fight back? And what does it do to their relationship? And yeah, it just everything just gets worse and worse and worse <laughs> for for both of them. Mm. Um, it's kind of like I kind of thought of it as like a as a as a psychological horror when I was writing it because you have that accumulation of dread. And you don't know, or well, you kind of know that things are going to keep getting worse, um, but you don't know exactly what's going to happen. So yeah, it was kind of. It, there's a lot of stuff in that book that was based on real, ex, real life experiences, um, but it's all kind of turned up to eleven, as they would say in Spinal Tap. <laughs> When the book sold well enough, you knew you were going to have to follow it up, this time with the murder of magpies. Was that more pressure or less pressure now that you had expectations hanging in the background? When I, when I finished the magpies, I thought, well, that's it. I, don't, I never intend to write sequels for any of these books. Um, and it actually took me five years of people saying, oh, we need to know what's going to happen. We need to know what, what happens next. And Lucy Newton, who's the, the baddie in the magpies, has cameos in most of my other books so I was kind of following her story in the background in the other novels anyway and then I finally thought well five years has passed now and I know what could happen next and then that book came out that was only a novella it was a short one and um and then I immediately thought well, I need to wrap this up now and and so I made it into a trilogy and wrote the third one which completely uh, ends the story Taking Magpies or a book like What You Wish For, what's your favorite part of really scaring the reader on the page? I mean, really creeping them out. Well, yeah, it is a, it is a rush. It is exciting. I love the idea of being able to scare people. And I, and I think that I'm constantly trying to make it scarier and scarier or more and more tense um, because I enjoy, personally, I enjoy that feeling of being really tense. Like when you're watching a good horror movie or reading a good horror book, you want that feeling, you want the emotion. The worst thing that you can do is, is bore people. So I'm always trying to keep people's emotions um, stirred up. And um, yeah, I do, I do listen to music while I'm writing. I, quite, I listen to quite a lot of film soundtracks, like um, 
moody um horror or or thrillers or crime stranger things is a good soundtrack to listen to um anything kind of electronic and um yeah that's i mean i don't personally scare myself when i'm writing people are quite often ask that and i don't get upset when i kill my characters <laughs> i i i enjoy it i think i when i one of my books here to stay um is about a pair of psychopathic in-laws who move in with their with my main character and his new wife and, and make his life um a living hell and uh, it was so much fun to write those characters, those in-laws. And my aim was to make people angry and frustrated and, and to want to reach into the pages and grab hold of the characters and, and like put their hands around their throats and throttle them. That was, that's what I was trying to do. Well, to throw their Kindle across the room in a rage. <laughs> Turning to the super creepy follow you home, how do you write stalkers so well? Do you actually interview one doing crime for the time or look at police files or does it just come to you in your imagination? Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't really, I don't do research in terms of um, doing that, going to, going to case files or uh, beyond kind of watching the occasional true crime show or... Do you imagine in your mind mostly? It's just, it's, just, it's coming from my imagination. I'm I'm trying to put myself into the mindset of somebody who's completely different to me. And my I have written about serial killers, um, and I've written about very kind of ordinary monsters who are just um, in a kind of domestic way trying to to wreck people's lives. I keep kind of mentioning the magpies in here to stay. Um, and the guy in the main baddie in Follow You Home um, is a kind of former Romanian war criminal. And that's not really something that I <laughs> know anything about from experience. But I, that is a major spoiler, by the way, <laughs> for people who haven't read the book. But it's, it's just the imagination. And I think that that, that is. That, that, that is so powerful. And I think that it's come to me from, from consuming so many other books and movies and TV shows and, and um, all of these sources and then mixing it with my real life. Um, so I do, re I, I read the occasional book about, um, about, I don't know what what it takes. What, what are the traits of a psychopath, for example? Um, but I, I I must admit that I don't do exhaustive research into it. It is mainly my imagination. And um, yeah, so far it's it's worked well. So and and also you've got to try and find a twist on on the on these baddies. So for example, in the Lucky Ones, which is my kind of more straightforward cop hunts a serial killer novel yeah um the serial killer in that wants his victims to be happy at the point of their death so his 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 whole thing is that he's going to do all of these favors for them they don't know he's like a guardian angel and he's manipulating their lives to make everything go right and then he takes them to their ha the place where they were happiest when they were alive and injects them with an overdose of morphine. <laughs> they don't even die in pain. They die with a smile on their face. That's kind of the way that he sees it. He believes that he's making people happy and, and putting an end to their lives when they're at their most blissful. And I kind of read um, Euripides, like the, um, the philosopher, the Greek philosopher, to kind of, that's that's where the research for that came in um and also harold shipman who's the doc, who's the most prolific serial killer in the uk who injected his patients with with morphine to murder them he murdered like 80 or 90 maybe even more people he's yeah he was a kind of doctor death yeah. so that's where the research for that book came from it came from a mix of philosophy <laughs> And, and a real life prolific serial killer.
The Devil's Works, another one of your master classes in psychological thriller writing. How important is setting in terms of really going for master chilling effect for the reader? So The Devil's Work is set in the office from hell. It's about the, the co-workers from hell. And it's about a young woman who's just come off maternity leave. In the UK, you get quite a long maternity leave. You can take up to a year off work. Um, on like full pay and then on on a kind of reduced maternity pay yeah but yeah we get and paternity pay as well you can get and um so she's just gone back to work after after this this long period and she starts managing this new team of people um at this publishing company children's publishing company and she starts to think that all of her colleagues are out to get her and all this weird stuff starts happening in the background and people disappear um, or suddenly leave work apparently to kind of go on trips, but no one knows where they've gone. And she starts to think that there's somebody in the office who's who's kind of trying to to destroy her life. This is a this is a common theme in my books. Somebody doing something very ordinary, like going to work or Going on, going on vacation or moving into a flat or something and terrible things happening to them. So yeah, that, that one was, that was actually the hardest book to write out of all of my books. Really? It took me, I normally can write a book in six to eight months and that one took me well over a year um, writing and rewriting and rewriting, getting it. I just couldn't figure out the plot. And I actually, what happened was I delivered it to my editor and he started reading it. And, and almost immediately I said to him, stop, stop reading it. I need, I need more time to work on it. And it was only kind of then in a kind of panic that I was able to, to figure out what was wrong with it and fix it. And I had to rewrite like 60,000 words in two weeks exactly yeah it was like going into an exam and having to <laughs> and having to perform with a book like the retreat which is actually set at a writer's retreat did that title come really obviously to you and are they often early on or late in the process so it's either that they come immediately like because she loves me or the retreat or I will spend months and months and months at the end agonizing over what the title should be and roping in all of my friends and and brainstorming. So they either come like that or they are like childbirth, very painful and very <laughs> intense. <laughs> so the retreat came, that was, I mean, it's a kind of obvious title because it's set at a writer's retreat. And it's always has that double meaning of it's kind of somebody retreating from from their life and from normality. They they've they've um, gone to stay at this writer's retreat to get away from everything that's wrong in their life, and they're they're trying to be able to create again. It's about a guy who's got writer's block, uh, who, um, who who's struggling to follow up a successful novel. And, um, and he moves into this apparently haunted um, house in the middle of Wales in the woods and there's a missing child and he, he gets completely distracted from trying to write his book because he, he's trying to find out what happened to this, this missing little girl who is the daughter of the woman who, who's running the retreat. Um, so in fact, that title came to me and I thought, no, that's too obvious. And then I spent ages trying to come up with an alternative title. And finally, the publisher said, no, we like the retreat. That's a great title. Let's just go with that. And so, so I did. But um, yeah, usually it's much more, much more painful than that. And it's so, the, the title is so important as well. Inner Shadow, was that one that came to you right away? No, that was one of the hard ones. And I'm still not 100% happy with that title. <laughs> if I could change the title of any of my books, it'd be that one, but I still don't know what I'd change it to. I don't think it does. It's not quite bold or strong enough. There's something about you've got the retreat, the magpies, follow your home. They're good, strong, solid titles. There's something about in her shadow that just doesn't have that same kind of, kind of oomph. 
to it that the others do. You were happy with the book itself, though. Yeah, yeah, I was happy with the book. Um, and I would, I mean, just to briefly describe that one, I would say that that book is like the sixth sense meets Big Little Lies. It's kind of school gates, um, domestic, motherhood, and like sisters and, and like sibling rivalry and stuff. But with the possibility that there's a ghost um, and this little girl who can who who can communicate with her dead aunt and knows all this stuff about her, even though she never met her. But with all of my books, there's never actually anything supernatural going on. There's always a rational explanation in the end. So the challenge for me is to come up with this seemingly totally inexplicable situation and then try and figure out how how it could happen in real life Just, and I, so I didn't know when I started that book I thought well there could be a ghost but how am I going to make it so there's not really a ghost say with a book like because she loves me do you tend to sound your dialogue out loud as you're writing a lot of authors I've spoken to for the show do I do it in my head and I kind of go over it um lots of times to try and make it sound as natural as possible dialogue's hard i mean i think probably that was the thing that took me the longest to to um get good at um and because i think when i first started writing in my 20s my the, the dialogue was a bit flat or a bit it just didn't didn't sound like real people so um i I practiced that. I practiced that over over many years, and I think that I'm, I think that I'm quite good at it now. I don't, I, I don't know. I, it, it's hard. I mean, when I was writing a screen, when I wrote, tried to write that screenplay, because it's pretty much all dialogue. Yeah. Um, I think that was actually one of the things that made that such a good exercise, just to try and get the story all across from dialogue and to make the characters come to life without being able to see inside their heads. So, I mean, I think that's quite a good tip for people. If writing a novel, try and tell your story through dialogue alone and see whether it works. That's, it's, it's, it's worth, it's worth, um, worth doing. Wow. So you actually hear different voices for different characters as they're coming to life on the page. That's just fascinating. I'm definitely there picturing the scene when it happens. It's, it's very, it's very visual for me. Um, uh, Although I don't really see their faces. I mm. don't, so they're kind of like, I, I see the setting, I'll see like, I don't know, the, the, the house or the trees or the, the street that they're walking down, but they're kind of faceless, shadowy faceless figures. Um, especially if I'm writing from their point of view, because I'm kind of looking out through their eyes. I'm not like looking in the mirror and seeing seeing what they look like um but i'm yeah i'm there and i kind of hear their voices but when people say to me oh which actor would you like to play this person or who do you see them as i'm always completely stumped because i don't i don't i don't know i i find that a really hard question to answer you collaborated over six books with louise voss in the detective patrick lennon series what made you two such a good co-writing team so Louise and I met after I was on a TV documentary back in 1999 about aspiring writers. And it was broadcast by the BBC in the UK. And I was an unpublished writer at that point. I was just talking about my, my aspirations. And she's one of the people who wrote to me or emailed me uh, via my agent. And we became friends and then she got a publishing deal before me. And then one night we were out having a drink and we came up with the idea of a book together. And it was actually our first book was called Killing Cupid. Um, and usually you kind of come up with these ideas and then the next morning you kind of think, well, that was just a kind of fun conversation. But we actually woke up the next morning and both thought, actually, that was a really good idea. We should do it. And so, yeah, we wrote this book. And it was another one like The Magpies that kind of sat around in a drawer for 
a long time and um, before it was published and it was eventually published by um, Harper Collins in 2012 and then we wrote five more um, we haven't written any together for a few years because we're both too busy writing our own solo books well I mean they're all quite different my favorite one is that there's two actually about viruses which are quite topical at the moment so yeah, they're Catch Your Death and All Fall Down. Um, and they're about a virologist having to basically stop a pandemic. <laughs> I mean, it's so unrealistic. I mean, in our book, they basically find the they find the vaccine um, on the last on the last page of the story and it's mass produced and rolled out across the world within a few, <laughs> a few days. <laughs> Unfortunately, as we know now, that kind of thing doesn't happen that quickly. Um, and then my favourite two are From the Cradle and The Blissfully Dead, which are um, detective novels um, set in London. Um, one of them is about um, a, 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 a few missing children. And I actually think that with and, and the, the guy who is trying to to find the children is called Detective Lennon. I going to ask about him, yeah. Yeah, so named obviously after one of the Beatles. Um, and yeah, he was he's one of my favourite characters to have written. He's, a lot of my male characters are quite passive, or they start off quite passive, and it's only when terrible things happen to them that they kind of, fight back but Lennon is much more um much more active and kind of more more macho I guess <laughs> in, not in a kind of Jack Reacher beating everybody up way but but yeah he's he's very confident and and um yeah he's a big Cure fan actually Cure I mention lots of times what about the Kate Maddox series, which features Catch Your Death and All Fall Down? Yeah, so she was the virologist in Catch Your Death. I think, yeah, we just, we both kind of wrote from her point of view and we kind of developed this joint voice. And to the point where after writing a few books together, we literally can't remember who wrote which bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, God, it feels like a very long time ago now that I wrote those books. What about Forward Slash? Your fans would send me hate mail if I didn't ask about the standalone you two wrote together. That's our darkest, nastiest book. So that's another serial killer book. Um, and it's, yeah, we, we, um, that was kind of slightly controversial when it came out because it was so dark and the murderer was so horrible in it um that people would be saying to us you well you obviously must be a twisted individual to be able to write something that nasty and that dark um and uh yeah i don't think i am <laughs> very nice <laughs> yeah i wrote the serial killer chapters in that book and i really had to kind of go to my darkest places i mean it was there were parts of that book and follow you home that after writing them, I kind of had to go and have a, have a shower to kind of clean off because it made me feel so dirty and so nasty and grim. Sometimes you have to, you do have to go into very dark, very dark places. Um, and usually I can kind of dip in and out quite easily. It doesn't really affect me, but yeah, some of them I have kind of, I have felt quite disturbed actually by, by the stuff that's come out of my own imagination. <laughs> You're a pretty well-read author in Britain. Have you ever tried to screen what your kids or say even your parents can read of your catalog? Oh, well, yeah. Well, my kids, I mean, my oldest daughter is 14 now. She's kind of been showing some interest in reading, reading my books. And there's a few that I'm quite happy for her to read. I do, it's the sex stuff that I'm not so comfortable with my kids reading. <laughs> Interesting. But the, but the the kind of which which sounds I, I think it's just the idea of your parent writing those kind of scenes for a kid must be pretty horrible.
whereas reading the murder scene isn't as I don't think it's as it's not as personal is it so um some of my books are, are quite a lot cleaner than others so they're the ones that I would be happy for them to read first but my mum reads all my books um and my my dad's read a few of them my wife reads all of them and my mother-in-law reads them all she's like the first person to read them so yeah I don't have any qualms about my adult relatives reading my books at all I'm not there looking over their shoulder when they're reading it so it's fine after 10 years and 3 million books and counting, how fun is it when you travel, like say to US or UK, Europe, Russia, where your books are all sold, to see one in an airport bookstore? Well, I mean, it's it's great. I mean, the best, the best things are, A, being able to make a living doing it. I mean, that is number one. And that's to, to actually have this as my, my full-time job now, after so many years of trying is, is great. And, and you have bad days sometimes, the writing's not going well, or I don't know, you're a bit annoyed with your publisher or your you see, oh, so-and-so seems to be getting more publicity than I'm getting. And all this kind of ridiculous stuff that you get stressed out about. Um, and then I have to remind myself, well, this this is the, I am actually do, do, living the dream of what I always wanted to do. And um, although I am, still very ambitious and I'm still trying to get better and I'm still um still trying I feel a kind of certain pressure to to keep up the standards and improve on it um I am in a I'm in a really good place and I'm really happy to be doing this doing what I've always wanted to do and I've got all of these books I don't know if you can see behind me there's like a yeah. book there with all my books on there and, and I know that kind of when I'm when I'm really old, <laughs> I'll have this. I'll, I'll be able to look tan. I have these tangible things that I can say that I've achieved and that I've kind of left. Even if I'm forgotten when I'm dead, I'll have achieved something in my in my lifetime. And that's these published books. And and that is a really great feeling. And I think that having a kind of a, 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 a kind of a place um, in the market where people kind of know what to expect from a Mark Edwards book, which is that it's going to be a, a psychological thriller with a kind with a, a, a horror element to it. That's definite motivation to keep up the inspiration. What's your advice for viewers in the audience who are aspiring authors on how to build the kind of loyal fan base you have? <sighs> First of all, I think, like I just said, if you can find something that sets you apart from the pack, that's really important. Now, for me, it's the kind of horror elements that I bring in, the horror tropes that I use, but without the supernatural stuff. But also just being male in the psychological thriller or the domestic suspense market actually makes me different to probably 80% of the writers who are writing in that in that space. And I've realized that because the books of mine that have done the best, or I should flip that and say the books of mine that have done the worst were the ones that were written from a female point of view. So actually the books that are written from a man's point of view or mainly from a man's point of view, it seems that my female readers, because 80% of my readers are women, they, they want they they enjoy this kind of book but they want to have some that they read from a from a male perspective and i get a lot of women will write to me and say i don't usually read male authors but i happened to pick up one of your books where it was on a special offer on amazon and i gave it a try and now i'm going to go and read the rest and that which is really good um and nurturing that relationship with readers is so so important and this is the great thing about the world that we live in now is that people have got access to read to writers and to we've got uh, access to readers so just from having my facebook page uh, my newsletter and my instagram my twitter um, it allows me to i mean i communicate with readers every single day of the week um, probably every waking hour I'm responding to a message 
from a reader, whether it's just replying to a tweet or a comment on an Instagram post or, or whatever. Um, and you, and you have to think that every reader is sacred. Every, you, it's very hard for a writer to go out there and find new readers. Your publisher, your marketer, your PR people, that's their job. But once you've got those readers, it's your job to hold on to them. And so that's the way that I see it. It's, it's about holding on to the readers that come to me and making them a want to read my next book and b recommend my books to their friends and the ways to do that are to make sure that your books are as memorable as possible that they're as full of as many memorable scenes as possible and that you have a really good ending especially that when they close that book they don't immediately forget it and just move on to the next book on their kindle or on their shelf that it lingers in their in their mind and so the next time their friend or their hairdresser or whoever says oh, have you read any good books lately they mention you and if you go above and beyond in the way that you communicate with your readers through your emails and your social media and by by communicating with people and being being nice to people they will be more likely to remember you and think of you as well it's about being kind of front of mind when they're choosing the next book I think that that kind of for me realizing that it's about I used to work in marketing and realizing that it's about that the retention of your audience is the most important thing um that's it's, you don't want to be one of those people who just goes out there kind of spamming people with buy my book, buy my book and kind of joining book groups or Facebook groups and just trying to get in there and put yourself in front of people and try and sell yourself. I know you have to do that to a little bit of a degree when you start out. Um, but for me, it's been a build up of, of um yeah, holding on to the and I, I do launch parties on Facebook every time I have a new book out. I do a live launch party and I give away like dozens, if not hundreds of prizes. And I get all these like special pens made and things and, and postcards and signed books. And every time I do one of these launch parties, I get like thousands of people will watch it. And it's the same people who come back but when I started, there was like 40 people watching it. And now there's thousands of them. And the people who were the, the original 40, a lot of them are still there. And they're kind of like, oh, it's, it's not fair because now the competition to win the prize is so much greater. So, but I, so you kind of have that balance of welcoming new people and, and um, not annoying the old people and, and making, them, making them feel like they, you still belong to them as well. So... Yeah, that's that's quite that's quite difficult, but it's um I'm not so I'm not like Stephen King level where it must be impossible to communicate with your readers because you've got so many millions of them. It's kind of I'm kind of at a nice, nice level where I can I remember their names, a lot of them, and and feel like I have a little personal relationship with a lot of my readers, but but um there's still enough of them to kind of <laughs> To, to um to, to make me earn a living that's the trick isn't it those are all great pieces of advice what do you tell authors once they're on the award circuit about how to handle it i haven't won many awards <laughs> i get nominated or shortlisted a few times um i think i've only won one or two but um which is fine which is fine i mean obviously it'd be nice to win the awards but to me selling lots of books is more important so um yeah i was at the thriller fest um festival in new york well not this year because of the pandemic cancelled it but the year before and some of my friends like jennifer hillier and cj tudor and helen smith um all won awards i love jennifer um, yeah and I was I was so happy for them and I genuinely felt I didn't feel any kind of envy or anything I was just genuinely so happy for them and to see 
see them celebrate and to be able to celebrate with them that's that's the nice thing about awards and it just makes people feel really good whether it actually helps to sell books or not i i'm a bit skeptical but it's it's a it's a nice thing to to have after being a master thriller writer for so many years say with house guests what are three or four fundamentals you feel like really have to be there to keep the readers on the edge of their seat so the so the setup of the house guest is you've got a british couple house sitting uh, for an american couple that they met um, in Brooklyn mm -hmm. and the, the American couple are away at a silent retreat in the middle of the New Mexico desert and they can't be contacted and then one day um, during a thunderstorm this young woman called Eden turns up uh, on the doorstep says that she is um, good friends with the with the uh, owners of the house and they said if you're ever in New York you can come and stay with us she's it's, it's pouring with rain she's drenched she's cold she's got nowhere to go and so my British couple let her in and let her stay because it's only a few more days till the house owners are due home and of course it's a thriller so she's not who she claims to be and shenanigans <laughs> ensue <laughs> Now, when I started this book, that was that was all I had. I literally just had that set up and I had it would just come to me. I don't know where or how I can't remember. Um, I went to stay in Brooklyn in an Airbnb. I rented and I literally rented the house that's in the book uh, with my with my family. Um, and then it actually took me a long time to figure out what else was going to happen. And it's really hard to discuss without spoilers, but there's something that happened in the real world, in the news recently, um, that kind of made me think about what was going to happen next in the book and what was really going on in the background. Um, and I think that that's what you need in a, in a thriller is you've got to have a really intriguing setup where people care about the characters and they care about what's going to happen to them and they and they're just desperate to know what's going to happen like i said earlier it's about making people feel emotions and and a kind of tension or dread you want them turning the pages as fast as they can to find out what happens next i mean that, that it's, it's as simple as that that is what it's all about you've got to you've just got to propel people forward in the story and um I think another really important element is the atmosphere and the setting. So for me, this was the first book that I'd set in America and it was really refreshing. And I think it gave the book a new energy after writing, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 books set in the UK um, to be able to set it in New York and, and, um, a city that even if you've never been there, you kind of know what it's like, you know what it looks like. Um, yeah, so the setting and the atmosphere and that kind of steamy heat that you get in the, in the summer in New York and the thunderstorms and the kind of those beautiful old houses in Brooklyn. Um, it's in, uh, in Williamsburg to be precise. Mm. Yeah, that was a really important ingredient, the setting. And so, and I always think about the setting before I start. It's, it's such, such an important aspect of the book. Before we close, please tell viewers what kind of scare they can expect out of your latest novel, The Hollows. So I've just finished my latest book, which is going to be called The Hollows. Um, it is again set in the USA. It's set in um, Maine. So treading onto Stephen King territory, I'm, I'm hoping not to get a cease and desist letter from Mr. King. <laughs> but it's set at a, a cabin resort in Maine. And um, uh, 20 years ago, this, this cabin resort was closed down. It used to be just an ordinary campground. It closed down after the brutal ritual murders of a pair of teachers. And now they've opened it up again and loads of dark tourists have descended on this, this newly open resort drawn by, the, by the, the mystery that still surrounds the murders. 
and again we've got a british main character it's a it's a guy in his 40s and his teenage daughter go to stay there and uh as always in one of my books weird stuff starts happening <laughs> in the woods this time and yeah i think this one's kind of one of my creepiest it's got kind of shades of stephen king little bits of friday the 13th um shades of like pet cemetery in it but yeah it's uh, it was really it was good fun to write it was tough but that'll be out next summer i think in july 2021 and i'm taking a couple of weeks off now and then i'll start i'll start work on the next one We'll definitely look forward to that. Mark, thank you so much. It's been a thrill having you on About the Authors TV. Okay, bye.